Hey, hello everyone. This is Ben Norton and this is Moderate Rebels. This is part of a live stream discussion that my co-host Max Blumenthal and I did with our colleague at the Gray Zone, Aaron Mate. In this part, we discussed the brutal U.S. dirty war on Syria, also backed by the European Union, Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, for 10 years, since 2011, these foreign powers have waged a brutal war to try to destroy the country of Syria, to overthrow its government. They were unable to do that, so now they're suffocating millions of Syrian civilians with crippling sanctions. They've helped destroy the Syrian economy, causing massive inflation, fuel shortages, bread shortages. I mean, it's absolutely devastating. And despite that, there has been a concerted campaign recently in 2021. Now that we, I mean, it's incontrovertible. We have so much evidence proving that these foreign powers led by the United States have spent billions of dollars meddling in this war, fueling this war to try to destroy Syria and its government and effectively its people. And yet recently regime change activists, including many in academia, Many of these pundits and fake intellectuals have signed an open letter attacking us and attacking really the U.S. and Western European anti-war movement as a whole, demonizing the anti-imperialist left as a whole. We talk about how absurd this open letter is and how absurd these attacks are by these regime changers and, and just how they live in a fantasy land, totally ignoring the horrible harm that not only has Washington and Brussels done to Syria, but is currently continuing to do to millions of Syrian civilians. Like I said, this is part of a live stream discussion that we did with Aaron Mate. And you can check out the other parts, including our parts on China and the Uyghurs and the, the dirty war, the new Cold War on Beijing. We also talked about the Biden administration's hawkish foreign, hawkish foreign policy and the Ukraine crisis and the, the NATO proxy war on Russia. So definitely check out those other parts. But without further ado, here is our discussion with Aaron Mate. Well, since we're talking about open letters, uh, sellout academics, should we move on to Syria? And the there was a recent attack on the gray zone uh, in a form of an open letter that uh, wouldn't have gotten any attention if it were not signed by Noam Chomsky, surprisingly. Now, it didn't directly name the gray zone. There's actually an, an interesting story there, which we'll get into. But um, it, uh, it's an amazing occurrence that as right now, after a 10-year dirty war, the U.S. is occupying one-third of Syria, is imposing what Patrick Coburn of the Independent calls the worst sanctions in the world on Syria that are preventing it from rebuilding, uh, are preventing it from importing food and medicine, preventing Syrians from even importing toothpaste because it's been labeled a dual use good, which means that toothpaste could be used to brush your teeth, but it also could be used supposedly for military purposes. Doctors have to smuggle in medical equipment to fix their broken parts. So in, in the midst of this, while all this is happening, this open letter comes out that instead of talking about this and what we can do to stop the continued torment of Syria, it attacks people on the left, what it calls the uh, anti-imperialism of fools, uh, and accuses us all of being Assadists and apologists for Iran and also for Chinese imperialism. I didn't know that China was an imperial <laughs> power inside of Syria. That was news to me. And when it gets to the US role, it says that it's, quote, not central. So a multi-billion dollar dirty war, one of the most expensive covert programs in the CIA's history, according to the New York Times, one that helped kill over 100,000 soldiers, according to US officials who privately bragged about it to the Washington Post. Um, and now a military occupation that controls Syria's wheat reserves, controls its oil, and crippling sanctions. And this letter is saying that the U.S. role is not central. And um, again, it wouldn't matter except for being another example of this academia culture that we're talking about of, you know, people coming up with these fancy ways to justify imperialism. But it got the signature of Noam Chomsky, uh, which is... Um, uh, and that's what got it some kind of cachet. And the story behind that is is interesting, which I'll talk about. But maybe, Max, you want to talk about this letter and your thoughts on yeah. it. Yeah, I actually knew about the letter 
um, early on, um, I'm going to actually bring up my own Twitter thread on it, but, uh, well, well, Max is bringing that up. I think one of the first things that we should point out is it was published on this website called yeah, Al which means Republic yeah. in, in Arabic. And this is a website that is funded by the European Endowment for Democracy, by the way, which is it's the European Union's equivalent of the United States government's National Endowment for Democracy, which, as any frequent the gray zone reader would know, is a CIA cutout spun out of William Casey's CIA under the Ronald Reagan administration. So the European Union made its own version, which is an, an arm of soft power for the EU, and it funds this website. And all they do is just attack the anti-war left, attack the anti-imperialist yep. left yep. nonstop. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious what their agenda is. And it's, it's like, it, it's serving a very important purpose. And it's the website of Yassin Al-Hajj Saleh, who is this, Syrian intellectual former, I mean, he lives in Turkey now and he's a lot like the French new philosophers that I described, like a former radical, former Marxist who parades around as a Marxist while attacking every Marxist who opposes the dirty war on Syria. And basically he, he literally was a, a U.S. informant, um, like so many of the kind of turncoat uh, figures in Lebanon who became U.S. assets, like uh, Lokman Slim, who recently died in a mysterious incident. But El Hajj Saleh, he's like the guru of all of these Syria regime changers in the academy, particularly in the U.K. He was profiled, I think, in the New Yorker as this great hero, and he gets to write all these New York Times op-eds. But he was literally a U.S. government informant in uh, WikiLeaks State Department cables that appeared on WikiLeaks. You can see him advising the U.S. Embassy in Damascus on how to form a coalition with Islamists as far back as 2000, 2006, which is why I always say like the, the the there was no 10th anniversary of the Syrian conflict. There was the, Syria's been under attack for decades, but anyway, that's who. Provided. Well, I just want to point out really quickly, because you mentioned this is a WikiLeaks cable, the same people attacking us and allying with y Yassina Hajshala, who is a U.S. embassy informant, they're also the same people who attack Julian Assange, and there's a reason that they attack him. You know, they smear him with all these different ways. No, they hate Julian Assange and WikiLeaks because it exposed their heroes, like Yassina Hajshala, to be direct collaborators with the U.S. government. Yep, yep. Uh, is just... He was just caught with his pants down. And then you have Gilbert Ashkar. So I learned about this because Ashkar was circulating the letter uh, for signatures. I have the email where he is you know, volunteering to circulate it. Who is Gilbert Ashkar? He is a Lebanese Trotskyist who supported, who like didn't support. He kind of issued the call among academics for a no-fly zone in Libya. Then he called for, and he said that his argument was so ridiculous. He said, if we support a no-fly zone in Libya, then we can call for the same in the Gaza Strip to prevent Israel from bombing Gaza. Like, yeah, that NATO is then going to turn around and say, wait a minute, we, we should do that there too because civilians are suffering. Yeah, we're just like an honest broker who applies the same standards to all people across the Middle East. Complete clown. Supported the same in Syria. His book, uh, Arabs in the Holocaust, which um, paints uh, Syria in particular and the Syrian government as sort of a base of Holocaust denial, was uh, published in Hebrew by an Israeli publishing house that is, you know, just a complete violation of the BDS call as well as the official Lebanese boycott. And everyone who signed this letter violated the Lebanese boycott. Uh, so all of the Arab academics who signed this letter violated the Lebanese boycott because it forbids working with Israelis and many Israelis signed this letter as well. And these were like Israeli anarchists and Trotskyists who I actually I, I've known. And they finally got to find common cause with Netanyahu by taking the Israeli position on Syria. Like the almost the entire Israeli radical left has taken the position of the Israeli military intelligence apparatus on Syria. It's pretty amazing to see. There's almost no one in the Israeli left who opposes the, the, Israel like paying uh, Wahhabi Salafi factions in the Golan, in the occupied Golan, 
giving them logistics and money, bombing Syria hundreds of times. None of them oppose it. None of them protest it. So, and the, then beyond that, the letter has been pointed out was... And I, uh, I just want to point out really quickly that Netanyahu himself has admitted that Israel has attacked Syria hundreds of times. It's actually more like thousands. So, I mean, these people, it's not hyperbolic at all. It's not like it's a secret. The Israeli government boasts that it has attacked Syria hundreds of times. Yeah. And not just Syria now, but also Iranian ships trying to deliver fuel to break the blockade of Syria to help right. it, you know, give people its basic needs. So now Israel is committing acts of terrorism, a lot of them on the open seas, trying to destroy these ships that are trying to bring fuel to Syria. Yeah. Well, and yeah. finally, there's so much to mention here, but really quickly, just while you mentioned uh, Gilbella Ashkar, who is the the this British Lebanese scholar, he also has, as we documented at the Gray Zone, I got access to these documents showing how he trained this elite UK military unit. And I mean, it's incredible. Like this is a guy who calls himself a Marxist. He's known as an academic, as a Marxist, which is insane. I mean, he's deeply anti-Marxist in so many ways. And he has actively on multiple occasions trained an elite UK military unit. I mean, that, that's just not support. That's not only support for imperialism. That's direct collaboration with imperialism. Like it's one thing even to sign an open letter, but this guy trains soldiers. Yeah, and so did Helen Lackner, who was also a uh, signatory um, of the letter. And uh, I mean, it's just amazing. These people pose as leftists and they're literally training an elite unit in the British military. It just doesn't get any more naked than that. But the point is here that the US is strangling Syria's economy. The Caesar sanctions are have caused a fuel crisis to the point where the roads of Damascus are emptying out. People are forced to stay home. Workers cannot go to their jobs. Who cares about the, the politics this is about people. It's about working people being completely destroyed. And the proxy war on Syria, I mean, one of the things I got to do when I was in Syria is meet Syrian workers who told me about how they faced car bombings, attacks while they were on their way to their jobs, while they were trying to go to the hospital, for example, they lost their legs. I mean, everyone was suffering so much under this proxy war. And it was just common workers. And now none of them can even take public transportation or few of them can take public transportation. There's rationing across the country. Americans don't know what it's like to experience that. And this is what the US specifically has brought to Syria. You have Joel Rayburn, who is the liaison to Syria under Trump, boasting that he tanked Syria's currency and that it's now what, 4,000 to the dollar? 4,000 Syrian pounds to the dollar. That's a boast that he made on Twitter. I mean, that is- yeah, a, James you know, Jeffrey, James Jeffrey, the, the sorry, Trump- Sorry, James on, Jeffrey. Anti, no, 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 no. So uh, Rayburn, who you mentioned, he boasted about plunging the currency. And then James Jeffrey, the Trump envoy to the anti-ISIS coalition, so-called, uh, he boasted in foreign affairs that US sanctions crushed Syria's economy. That's a direct quote. So we have US officials openly bragging about destroying a country's economy after a decade long dirty war that we were a big part of. And you have this letter coming out, not attacking them, but attacking the uh, uh, anti-imperialists who are trying to call attention to it. And what's funny about this story, there's a backstory. So Gilbert Ashkar, who you mentioned, uh, he was a big organizer of this and he is responsible for sending it to Chomsky. And I don't wanna reveal everything that I talked about um, that I discussed with Chomsky about this because I don't want to. But you had a conversation with Noam Chomsky about his signing of this letter. Yeah. So afterwards, I wrote him and we, and we had a long exchange. And the point is so initially, that open letter included all of our names, included you two, me, Rania, Anya, um, it named the Gray Zone, it named other uh, websites too, and named even some US peace groups, like people like PSL, anti war groups. And so uh, Noam said that he refused to sign it. And so at that point, if Gilbert and the other organizers really felt strongly about calling us out, you know, why didn't, you know, they should have said to Noam, I think, sorry, but like we're, we believe so strongly that these people are destructive. We're, we're going to leave it in. So we can't have your signature. But Gilbert and the other organizers caved immediately and took out all of our names because for obvious reasons, if they had just signed it, nobody would have cared. 
But getting Chomsky's signature carries some kind of weight on the left. And the reason Chomsky says he signed it is that it didn't attack anyone personally and was just expressing a general principle of support for the Syrian people who rose up against Assad and is criticizing people who try to minimize uh, their uprising. And, you know, we can get into all that. And we, we had a long back and forth and blah, 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 blah. I mean, I try to point out that the, the tactics of this letter are the same tactics that were used against him his entire career uh, with like Mac McCarthyite insinuation, insinuations that he's really a dupe of the Russians or whoever the enemy of the day is. In this case, this letter even threw in the Chinese. Like, is, is it China somehow an imperialist power inside of Syria? That's what it tried to insinuate. But, you know, I, I didn't get very far in um, in in convincing him. And just what he said was he was expressing a an abstract statement of principle. And he said that even if he knew that the originators wanted to attack him originally, he still would have signed it because he just was expressing support for an abstract principle. So I mean, whatever. I think it was totally cowardly on Gilbert Ashkar's part because I'd personally, if you're going to attack me, I'd much rather be named so you can, de so you can defend your characterization of me, defend your characterization of Ben Norton and Max Blumenthal, like show us where we're doing the things you accuse us of. But it was more important for them to get Noam Chomsky's signature than it was to actually stand behind their firm beliefs. Well, I want to point out really quickly, this is the original letter that was going around. We got sent a copy of, and it has the top of it is this solidarity delegation, including Max, Rania, <laughs> Anya, and 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 and, of, and someone who was in uh, Robin Island with Nelson Mandela from the ANC, among other figures. Yeah, Ajamu Baraka, right. who's, I mean, there's so many great people here. Like, th this is, it's incredible that they're attacking basically the entire anti-war movement. And as you, and what's incredible about this photo, I mean, they use this photo to try to attack the Solidarity Group. It says very explicitly, it's the Trade Union Forum for Solidarity with the Workers and People of Syria Against the Economic Blockade, Imperialist Interventions, and terrorism. This is a labor union federation. That's what they're talking about. Like, it's so crazy. The They're, they're trying to make it like Assad himself personally, like invited you all to a, a candlelit dinner and tried to woo you or something. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the Syria trip too much. I mean, it, it, it the, the, the Ba'ath party basically controls the Syrian state. So, I mean, there were, I knew that it was going to be, there were going to be attacks, but I wanted to go there and see what it was like on in this in this place where most Syrians live and I got to go off on my own me and Anya were off on our own completely uh we had a, a Syrian American friend who's a businessman who actually initially supported uh, a lot of the um some of the protests against Assad early on uh Naji who uh was like I mean, we didn't have a government fixer. It was it was him who was like, you know, having dinner with us and we stayed on our own in the old city. We had like no government fixers or no government oversight. We went wherever we wanted, saw whatever we wanted. And uh, so the harm was that that was the real like danger of our trip. That was the real threat of our trip. And like one of the points Naji would make was that, yeah, I supported what I thought was a reformist uh uprising but then when i realized like so many syrians like most syrians that where this was leading was to the complete dissolution and destruction of the state i stepped out and the so-called rebels destroyed my factory after making me swear that i was not an alawite and say yeah. the shahada so uh yeah i met so many syrians like that so then i met people with diverse opinions who were very critical of the government and the the president himself but you know the real threat was that we were talking to them that we were having this dialogue um but back to chomsky i mean this is the interesting part well, i really well, 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 quickly just well i have this letter up i mean so so we know the context of this letter because as aaron spelled out the original letter named all of these people and basically it's it's many of the the most prominent figures in the united states and overall western anti-war movement along with basically all of the major anti-war groups in the United States. So they name us and also Rania, who's not with the gray zone, but she's a friend of us. They also name Tim Anderson, Caitlin Johnstone. They name the working group on Syria propaganda. They name Mint Press News, Consortium News, Antiwar.com, Moon of Alabama, Jimmy Dore. 
And then they also name the U.S. Peace Council, Veterans for Peace, <laughs> Workers World, United National Anti-War Coalition, and Party for Social Liberation. I mean, these uh, are all of the major institutions the black of anti-war list. left. It's, it's a McCarthyite blacklist. Yeah. And, you know, the like British deep states, like dirt devil slash coffee boy, Idris Ahmad, I'm sure had a role in it because he got really upset that those names were removed. Then he removed his tweet. That's like his, his role in life. I remember seeing a tweet by him. This is like the number one online stalker of any anti-imperialist. He kind of plays the role on Twitter that uh, the uh, mysterious Philip Cross and Bob from Broccoli, who's actually an academic named uh, Ben Gidley, play on Wikipedia. And I feel like there's some integrity initiative type uh, operation going on there. I mean, he even phoned me, somehow got my phone number to threaten me before I published uh, expose of the white helmets, threatening me against doing that. But uh, I remember seeing a tweet by him once where he said, it's 5 a.m. and I have to be up writing a denunciation of Noam Chomsky for signing, I think it was signing one of the letters supporting the OPCW whistleblowers, which Aaron, you can talk about in a second. But yeah. I mean, the key operative phrase there was, I have to be up at 5 a.m. It's like, it's his job to basically be a narrative manager and attack and intimidate anyone who violates the parameters of the British deep state's narrative. And so he's, he was mad about this letter, removing all of, removing that McCarthyite blacklist. And Ch yet they got Chomsky to sign onto the letter. And I thought, yeah, that was important for them, but it was also important in the discrediting of Chomsky because what they did was they got Chomsky to denounce himself as a traitor because he had been signing other letters in support of the whistleblowers who are calling out the Duma deception, this pro-war deception that Aaron has done a lot of work on. And I find it sad. I mean, how Chomsky's at the end of his life. His, he's, he's establishing the final stage of his legacy and he's contradicting himself. And what people need now is consistency and guidance uh, and I, you know, there's been inconsistency throughout Chomsky's career. He, uh, he's, you know, celebrated the fall of the Soviet Union, but then opposed the hegemonic new world order that the U.S. imposed afterwards. He signed a lot of weird letters. He wrote a like letter of support for the French Holocaust denier, Robert Faurisson, but I can see how he could justify no. it. He supported, like, he supported his freedom of speech. He supported his freedom of speech. Yeah. Chomsky's a free speech absolutist. I'm just saying he yeah. signed a lot of letters. Yeah. He, you know, has been a harsh, in the 90s, he was like one of the harshest public critics of the Democratic Party from the left. And he would mock people who would like defend Bill Clinton against the Im impeachment scam and all that. But now he's like attacking or criticizing people who don't f vote for Biden um, on the left because they're supporting Trump. And, you know, he wears like goofy hats supporting Greta Thunberg. And it's just like not the, they're like, it's not the Chomsky that I knew. Uh, I wonder what's I mean, going I just wanna, on. I just want to say this on public record. He's 92. And basically at this point, all the people like trying to use Chomsky to attack the anti-war movement, that's just like elder abuse at this point. Well, like, you know what? Listen, he's I not don't as sharp as I, I don't want to say that. I still think that yeah, he's really agree. there. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think he's totally there. And, and I have a more sympathetic view to him now. Of course, he's the most influential intellectual on me, uh, a profound impact on my life and thinking about the world. So I'm very biased when it comes me to that. Too. But, me too. But yeah, but you know, I don't think we need to get into too much of analysis of him. I'll just say from his point of view, I got from talking to him that he was very influenced by going to Lebanon and meeting with members of the uh, anti-government uh, movement who had fled to, to Lebanon, who felt betrayed by the world and wanted more support. And I think, you you know, in the same way, Max, like you went to a, a refugee camp in Jordan and heard from all people who, for people wanted, who wanted the U.S. to bomb. So he met with people like that. And I think my takeaway was, it was he was very impacted by that. And what I was trying to impart to him is I don't think he was taking into account what the imp what the impact was of the policies that ultimately he would be supporting if he went along with what those people wanted, which is the further destruction of the state. And that he also recognized that no state has a right to intervene in a country like Syria. So accordingly, where I think his blind spot is, is like he holds the Syrian government responsi responsible for the most part for crimes that were committed as a result of a war that was imposed from abroad. 
And he conflates that with the very real protest for reform that that arose in the early stage of 2011. And I think it's a blind spot. I think it's a blind spot. I think it's too bad, but I don't think he's he's still very, you know, he's still he's, he's still very principled when it comes to the OPCW whistleblowers and he he won't deny the reality of what the US did. He just for some reason doesn't think it was as central as as people like we do. I I I, I question whether it's a blind spot um given previous positions he's taken. And, you know, when I was momentarily taken in by some of the opposition's narratives, I mean, I think I, I, I was inconsistent because I would go after the opposition for trying to push direct military intervention, but then I would make these sympathetic statements. And, you know, we did a whole moderate rebels episode on this and my evolution on Syria and Ben's evolution and Rania's as well. She was a guest. Uh, so you can check that out. I don't want to go into it too much, but I was in the process of evolution and understanding where the the Arab Spring was leading us and seeing these states being broken down and seeing the destruction of entire societies and how it was, you know, playing out. And ultimately I was able to, I think I was able to self-correct. It changed me a lot. Um, and Chomsky at the, for, for his part, I don't think he's obviously not in a, a process of evolution right now. Although, you know, Joseph Massad in a pretty scathing piece, um, which was initially published in Arabic and is now at Middle East Eye, um, pointed out that Chomsky, you know, has softened politically as uh, he's much more close to the center than he was in the 1970s or even in the 19. 90s, but he's an anarcho-syndicalist. He's even written a book spelling out his anarcho-syndicalist ideology. And this is someone who therefore does not believe in states. He doesn't understand the importance or he, he doesn't respect the importance of maintaining a state structure where if you do regime change in Syria, you're not just removing big bad Bashar al-Assad, you're actually dismantling an entire government and all of its ministries, uh, which we're seeing, and we're kind of slowly seeing that unraveling through the sanctions and the effect on civilians is devastating. Same as what we saw in Libya. Um, you can point to the Soviet Union too, the collapse of the Soviet Union, which he welcomed and celebrated. And we saw what happened to Russians in the 1990s. So I think it's not a bug, but an actual feature of his ideology. And it's something that Michael Parenti always criticized about Chomsky. And I say that as someone who really respects him. And he had an impact on me when I was younger and I was more coming from like a liberal background. Um, but, you know, I think at this point, I, I, I wish he could, you know, self-correct instead of falling into these contradictions and traps. Well, I well, think that's Chomsky's yeah. main utility. I mean, for me too, Chomsky is a good kind of gateway figure into anti-war politics, anti-imperialist politics, but he's often not consistent. And but he but because he's not consistent and because he's still a diehard anti-communist and has always been, he can help win over some more liberal people who become more sympathetic to leftist critiques and then eventually they see his weaknesses. Well, I'd also understanding that you know Chomsky has done a lot of good things, but he definitely has some weaknesses. All right, I think we're getting too far afield. I don't agree with your guys' characterization of him. I don't think you can call him, for example, a diehard anti-communist. I think he cheered the fall of the Soviet Union because he saw it as I mean, a... Yeah, th this player. is a long point, conversation, point, point. but but Aaron, he, he, he repeatedly point, point, referred point, to the point, Soviet point, Union point. as an open-air prison. I mean, Chomsky he, he has been a lifelong it. diehard anti-communist. He, he saw it as a system of tyranny. and He called it an open-air prison. He called the I, Soviet Union an open air prison. Okay, I, I don't know that quote. I'll look it up. I, I promise I will. I but, said I, Chomsky has done a lot of important but, things, and, and but some he, of his books he, are he very spent important. His, he spent his life. He spent his life criticizing and being attacked by actual diehard anti-communists who wanted to silence him. So I, I just don't know if you can characterize him as a diehard anti-communist. He was critical of the Soviet Union. Well, that's the Union, irony of anti-communism is they always go. I mean, that's the irony of Huwak and all these institutions is they always go after people who are insufficiently anti-communist but anyway whatever i, I mean so i'm not going to hold i'm not going to criticize chomsky for calling the soviet union a tyrannical system it, it, it was i mean my my father lived under it so you know and, and and i don't think he ever ever minimized the crimes of u.s imperialism and u.s imperialism's role in actually making the soviet union even more uh, authoritarian 
and actually preventing its development. He never minimized that. So anyway, but I think we're getting too far afield. What I think in this case is that, uh, as I said, I think he sees this authoritarian in Syria and he's conflated the real democratic sentiment that existed in those early months of 2011 with the dirty war that that was um, imposed on Syria. And there's this tendency to like hold Assad responsible for solely for crimes that were committed as a result of a war that he did not start. And I think that Chomsky's fallen for that, and I think it's too bad. But I think it's worth debating. At the same time, Chomsky is still signing letters in support of the OPCW whistleblowers. If you were to ask him to sign a letter condemning the U.S. sanctions on Syria, he would. So I just think, I don't want to go to, I, I think this was awful, him signing this. And I told him that. But I just, I personally will disagree. I only go, I don't go as far as you guys do in my critique. Is uh is is a Jeet Singh anywhere in the in the building or I mean, what happened? Yeah, I'll get a Jeet on if you want to transition and conclude on Syria. Um. Yeah, I mean we could talk about it all night, but I think uh, it's important to cover the China issue because that's the the new chosen evil doer of our time. Okay, we're gonna take a pause there. If you want to support this work that we're doing, go to patreon.com slash moderate rebels and definitely check out the other parts of this discussion that we had with our colleague Aaron Mate, including we talked about in other, in other, in other parts the kind of rad live liberal imperialist in Western academia who use postmodernist philosophy to justify empire and neoliberalism, frankly. We also talked about the hawks in the Biden administration's foreign policy department and the, you know, how the State Department under Anthony Blinken is extremely hawkish and really almost identical to the State Department of Mike Pompeo. And then we also have another part with friend of the show Ajit Singh talking about China and the Uyghurs and all of the anti-Beijing propaganda and the new Cold War led by Washington. So definitely check out those other parts. As always, we want to thank everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.